ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Alhamdulillah we praise Allah and seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from our bad deeds whoever Allah guides there's none that can lead him astray and whoever is led astray then there's no guide for him I bear witness that no god has the right to be worshiped other than Allah he is alone and has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger O you who believe fear Allah as you ought to be feared and don't die except as Muslims O humanity for your Lord who has created you from a single soul and created from it its mate and scattered from them to many men and women and fear Allah to whom you demand your mutual rights and don't cut off relations with the wounds that bore you indeed Allah is a raqib over you O you who believe fear Allah and say that which is correct in order that he may accept from you your deeds and forgive you of your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has achieved the greatest achievement of ma ba'du Certainly the most truthful speech is the book of Allah and the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the most evil of affairs and newly invented matters in this deen and every newly invented matter in this deen is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is a string and every string is in the hell fire. Uh, we're continuing with fiqh in the book Ad-Durr al-Bahiyya al-Imam al-Shawkani with the ta'liqat or the commentary with the evidences from Al-Adillat Al-Radiyya li Muhammad Subhi Hassan Al-Halaq and we come to the statement of Imam Al-Shawkani Rahimahullah Al-Bab Al-Rabi' Bab Al-Wudu Al-Fasl Al-Awwal Fara'id Al-Wudu wa qala Al-Shawkani Rahimahullah yajibu ala kulli mukallafin an yusammiya idha dhakara wa yatamadmada wa yastanshaqa thumma yagsila jami' wajihi ثم يديه مع مرفقيه ثم يمسح رأسه مع ذنيه ويجزئ مسح بعض والمسح على العمامة ثم يغسل رجليه مع الكعبين وله المسح على الخفين ولا يكون وضوءا شرعيا إلا بالنية لاستباحة الصلاة Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah, he says, uh, chapter number four, the chapter of wudu, in section number one, uh, that which is compulsory from the wudu. And Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah, he says, it's compulsory on everyone who is a mukallaf, meaning responsible in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had reached puberty, compulsory on him to say Bismillah if he remembers or when he remembers and to say and to uh, rinse the water in his mouth and spit it out and to sniff the water up his nose and to uh, blow it out and then to wash all of his face and then his hands up to the elbow and including the elbow and then to wipe his head with the two ears with wiping over the two ears along with the head and it is sufficient if he wiped some of his head and over his turban then to wash his two feet up to the ankle and it is permissible for him to wipe over uh, the hoofs and the wudu is in an Islamic wudu until he has the niyyah or the intention 
to make himself uh, in the state that would make it permissible for him to make salat. Whereas Shawkani rahimahullah meant when he said listibahat salat. So here Imam Shawkani rahimahullah is giving us the basis of making our wudu. And we find this in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Shaykh, he didn't bring this ayah, but we're adding it, inshallah ta'ala. It's from Surah Al Ma'idah, chapter number 5, verse number 6, where Allah tabarak wa ta'ala tells us, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, idha kumtum ila salati taghsilu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum ila al marafiq. وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ To the end of that ayah. Well, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He says, O you who believe, when you want to establish the salat, then wash your faces and wash your hands up to the elbow and including the elbow and wipe over your heads and wash your feet up to the ankle. This is the basis from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we see the wudu stemming from. Some of the people, uh, they say that this wudu is the wudu that is compulsory. This wudu mentioned in this ayah in the Qur'an, that whoever does it like it was mentioned in the Qur'an, then this is sufficient for him. However, this Qur'an is to be understood in light of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu as Allah tells us in Surah Al-Nahal verse uh, at the end of verse number 44 وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And we have revealed to you the dhikr or the revelation referring to the Qur'an and also the sunnah to explain to humanity what has been revealed to them so that perchance they may uh, reflect here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu is the one who showed us how to make the wudu based on this ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And never did the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu as the ulama say, that it's never been reported on him that he only did that which was mentioned in the Qur'an. And the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu as he came to explain it. Uh, though this is the position of one of the madhabs, one of the four madhabs, but uh, it's clearly wrong because the Prophet ﷺ didn't do it. And we'll bring another example to make it even clearer as some people give credence to a mistake because it's a part of one of the well-known madhabs or the Hanafi madhab. The people who consider themselves Qur'aniyun, who are kuffar, who think that we only follow the Qur'an and we don't follow that which was narrated to us, from the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam as you have some in Algeria and some of the different places of the Muslim world. These people, when they make salat, they say all you have to do is stand, make the rukur, and to prostrate. And so long as you have a standing and a bowing and a prostration, then your salat is correct. They don't say anything that you have to say that to shahud that you have to recite Fatiha, all of this they don't say, you, you don't have to do it because it's not mentioned in the Qur'an. And Allah commands us to establish the Salah and He mentions Qiyam, wa Rukur, wa Sujood, so that's sufficient for us. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, is the one who came to explain what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean when He said that. When Allah said establish the Salah, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, explained to us what we say in the Rukur, what we say while we're standing, what we say in the prostration, and that there's two rakats for fajr and four rakats for dhuhr, that this is from the explanation of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, as oftentimes Allah mentions things in the Qur'an in general, because He sent His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam to explain it to the people. So the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, recited the Qur'an to the people and told them, this is how you do it. Recited the Qur'an to the people, and then He showed them how to do it, as we had just mentioned uh, recently, the statement of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha when she was asked about the character of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, do you read the Qur'an? He said, of course I read the Qur'an. He said, then you would know that the character of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, is the Qur'an. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived the Qur'an and we'll see from this, from uh, authentic hadith, from his sunnah, that which is attached to this ayah 
that is also compulsory because it comes from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We say it's compulsory and it comes from the sunnah. The word sunnah has different meanings. You have sunnah, which is the common meaning that means it's recommended. That's sunnah, meaning that's recommended as the people usually say. You also have from the sunnah, meaning that which is compulsory from Islam. And this is, like you say, Zuhur, Allah doesn't mention in the Quran that it's four rakahs. How do you know that it's four rakahs? From the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Is it compulsory to make Zuhur four rakahs? Nobody doubts that it's compulsory to make four rakahs. And this is from that which comes from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, which is compulsory. It's from the sunnah, meaning the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, uh, explained it to humanity, but it's compulsory, meaning it has to be done if the act is going to be complete, and we'll see the same thing in the wudu, inshallah ta'ala, as we take a look at the hadith collected by Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah, and other than them, on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, qala, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la salata liman la wudu'a lahu, wa la wudu'a liman lam yadkur ismallahi ta'ala alayhi. Uh, and this hadith is authentic insha'Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best as the ulama differ uh, as to the authenticity of this hadith where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there is no salah for the one who doesn't have wudu and there is no wudu for the one who doesn't mention the name of Allah ta'ala before his wudu so from this hadith uh, and we're with the, those who say that it's authentic and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that uh, this wudu has to be said at the time of mention at the time of making the wudu as we see from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam and this is what Imam al-Shawkani is saying when he says it's compulsory on everyone who is responsible in the sight of Allah that he makes the statement Bismillah when he remembers. And this is from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, there's no wudu, there's no salah for the one who doesn't have wudu, and there's no wudu for the one who doesn't mention the name of Allah Ta'ala uh, over his wudu. And it is compulsory for him to uh, rinse his mouth out with water and to sniff the water up his nose and blow it out as we see from the hadith of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And these two points, rather these three points so far, aren't mentioned in the ayah. That you say Bismillah, and it's not mentioned that you rinse the water in your mouth and out of your nose. But we see from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the, uh, excuse me, on the authority of Humran, Mawla Uthman ibn Affan, Annahu ra'a Uthman da'a bi wadu'in فأفرغ على يديه من إنائه فغسلهما ثلاث مرات ثم أدخل يمينه في في الوضوء ثم تمضمد واستنشق واستنثر ثم غسل وجهه ثلاثا ويديه إلى المرفقين ثلاثا ثم مسح برأسه ثم غسل كل رجل ثلاثا ثم قال رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نحو وضوئي هذا وقال من توضأ نحو وضوئي هذا ثم صلى ركعتين لا يحدث فيهما نفسه غفر الله له ما تقدم من ذنبه حمران the Mawla or the servant of Uthman ibn Affan رضي الله عنه he saw Uthman uh, ask him to bring a container of water to make the wudu. And he poured from the container over his hands and he washed them three times. And then he dug his right hand in the container and he uh, took the water out, rinsed his mouth out and blew the water out and he sniffed the water up his nose and he blew it out. <clears throat> and then he washed his face three times and then his hands up to the elbows including the elbows three times and then he wiped over his head and then uh, he washed his feet 
three times, and then he said, this is, uh, then he said, I saw the Prophet wasallam make a wudu, just like the wudu I've just made. And then he said, sallallahu wasallam, whoever makes a wudu, like this wudu that I just made, and then makes two raka'at, and he's not being distracted in those raka'at, that Allah would forgive him of all his past sins. So here we see from this hadith of Humran, the Mawla of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the wudu of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and we see that he rinsed his mouth and spit the water out and sniffed the water up his nose and <coughs> uh, blew it out. And this uh, is from the wudu of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasalam, the one who has come to explain the Quran. And we also see from this uh, hadith uh, the way that this deen has come to us. That the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he recited the Quran and he practiced it. And then the companions of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, they practiced it. And then those who came after them, as we see the Mawla of Uthman, Humran, was coming after him from the Tabi'een, that he sees Uthman do something. And then Uthman says, I saw the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, do something. This is how the deen came to us. And if someone thinks that he's going to jump over all of those people straight to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why don't he just jump right over top of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and go straight to Jibreel to say he's getting the deen straight from the source. Or to go be above Jibreel like some of the Sufis and to say, my heart, uh, my heart narrates to me on the authority of my Lord such and such. As the Sufis say, we don't need any of the Salaf or the Prophet ﷺ or Jibreel, but that our heart can narrate straight from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what they really mean is straight from the shaitan. As this revelation either comes from Allah or the shaitan. The shaitan, he reveals to his people what he reveals to him as he reveals to them this statement, it was narrated to me by my heart on the authority of my Lord. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ So here we see <coughs> that this rinsing of the mouth and the blowing, uh, sniffing up the water up our nose and blowing it out. This is from the wudu of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's compulsory that the Muslims do this. And this uh, is the explanation of this ayah of wudu. Yes, and the, and the hadith? Yes. <coughs> and we're going to get to uh, that part again in, anyway, inshallah. The hadith says that from this had, uh, hadith of Uthman, we're going to save those parts to the time when they come. As it was mentioned before it, uh, before he rinsed his mouth that he tipped the container to wash his hands three times and then he dug his hand in the container and began the wudu and we'll talk about this washing of the hands three times before uh, uh, before the wudu but right now we're just trying to discuss as Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah is discussing that which is compulsory and because of the wo- uh, the book Sifat uh, wudu of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the description or the described wudu of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the author com- tried to combine all of the authentic narrations on wudu and put it in one book. Imam al-Shawkani rahimullah, and we mentioned in the beginning that Imam al-Shawkani rahimullah is covering our fiqh from A to Z in a small book, so that in general we can have the basis of this deen to get it down. And then after that, there are more details for those who want to go the extra uh, mile, if you want to say, to get those details down, to try to follow the Messenger of Allah, not only in that which is compulsory and recommended, but even in the other things that the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, did. So because of that book, is going to force us to deal with those questions that stem from it, and we'll try to do our best, inshallah. Wa alaikum salam about saying Bismillah before the wudu, is there a prohibition of saying the name of Allah in a room with a toilet in it, like the common bathrooms of today? 
No, I don't know that there's a prohibition of mentioning uh, Allah's name in one of the bathrooms that we have today where we have the toilet and then the sink right there. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then Imam Ashokani rahimullah he says, and then to wash the face, and then to wash all of his face. And this is <coughs> uh, from the straight from the ayah, and to wash your faces. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then wash your faces. And also, as we saw from the hadith of Humran, the servant of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had mentioned, and then to wash the face three times. So we see from this ayah directly, and then also in the hadith of Humran. Uh, Mawla Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu Then you wash all of your face And then he says And to wash the hand up to the elbow And this uh, is also Straight from the ayah المرافق, And to wash your hands Up to the elbow This washing the hands uh, Up to the elbow And we also saw it in the hadith of uh, Humran To wash the hands three times up to the elbow Washing the hand from the elbow doesn't start from the wrist to the elbow. As people understand, all right, you start your wudu off, you wash your hands three times. Then you do your mouth, then you do your nose, then you do your face, then you're washing your arms up to the elbow. And uh, there used to be some people who just wash from the wrist to the elbow here. But it's compulsory to wash from the hands to the elbow. Because that washing of the hands in the beginning is a recommendation that goes along with the wudu, not a part of that which is compulsory in the wudu of washing your hands up to the elbow, which is this part after the face. You want to wash from your hands, meaning from the tip of your middle finger or your longest finger, including your whole hands, up to your elbow, including your elbow. Including your elbow. And this is a point that uh, everyone has to be aware of, inshallah, who... Uh, Ta'ala. So, um, yes. If you if you started and you didn't wash your hands, you just took the water from your nose and mouth. That's that, that's acceptable. It, uh, if you, this, yeah. If you didn't wash your hands, you understand what you're saying by washing your hands first. You yeah. just wash get the excess off. If, if you just start like this, if you just start fresh with the wudu without washing your hands, then your wudu be complete, inshallah Ta'ala. As Imam Ashokani, we're covering those points that are compulsory. And he didn't mention in the beginning to wash your hands three times before he mentions his part to wash your hands three times up to the elbow and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. But this part of washing your hands up to the elbow, this is the part that's far from the wudu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to in the Quran after washing your face and that the Prophet sallam did in the ahadith. <coughs> After that, Imam Ashokan, rahimullah, he says, and then to wipe the head. And this is from directly from the ayah, and then to wipe over your head. And as we saw from the hadith of uh, Humran, Mawla Uthman, he has the same thing, and then he wiped over his head. So we see from uh, that hadith and from the ayah that you wipe over your head. And then Imam Ashokan, rahimullah, he says to... Uh, and also to wipe over the two ears And this is from the hadith collected by Abu Dawood And at tirmidhi And Ibn Majah On the authority of Abu Umama Radiallahu anhu Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Qala al-udhunani min al-ra'si And this hadith is authentic Inshallah Where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said the two ears are part of the head And this uh, shows the wiping of the two ears along with the head because the two ears are part of the head and they go together with the wudu as we see from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. Then Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah he goes on to say and it is sufficient to wipe over some of the head and to wipe along with it the turban. And we see this from the hadith of Al-Bukhari on the authority of Amr ibn Umayyah. قَالَ رَأَيْتُ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَمْسَحُ عَلَىٰ عِمَامَتِهِ وَخُفَيْهِ 
where Umran ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu he says that I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wipe over his turban and this hadith is from Bukhari and it's authentic uh, and it adds over his turban and over his two khufs so from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallatu salam we see also the wiping over the turban and then to wash the feet the two feet and this is directly from the ayah وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And to wash your two feet up to the ankle. And also from the hadith of Humran, the Mawla of Uthman. And also uh, uh, the Shaykh, he brings the hadith uh, collected by Imam Muslim on the authority of Nu'aym ibn Abdullah al-Mujmiri قَالَ رَأَيْتُ أَبَا هُرَيْرَةَ يَتَوَبَّعُ فغسل وجهه فأسبغ الوضوء ثم غسل يده اليمنى حتى أشرع في العضد ثم يده اليسرى حتى أشرع في العضد ثم مسح رأسه ثم غسل رجله اليمنى حتى أشرع في الساق ثم غسل رجله اليسرى حتى أشرع في الساق ثم قال هكذا رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتوضأ وقال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنتم الغر المحجلين المحجلون يوم القيامة أنتم الغر المحجلون يوم القيامة من إسباغ الوضوء فمن استطاع منكم فليطل غرته وتحجيله Nu'im ibn Abdullah al-Mujmiri Rahimahullah He said that I saw Abu Huraira Radiallahu anhu make wudu And he washed his face And he uh, did the wudu good Then he washed his hands His right hand And he began going up to his muscle I don't know what you call that part Up towards his biceps and his triceps Showing that he really covered his elbow, his elbow. And then he washed his left hand until he began going up to his muscle to the bicep and the tricep area. And then he wiped over his head. And then he washed his right foot and he began going up his calf. Showing that he really covered his ankle. And then he did his left foot going up to his calf showing that he really covered his ankle and then he said this is the way that I saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make wudu and he said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that you will have light on yawm al qiyamah from making a good wudu so whoever has the ability to uh, uh, go up farther than the ankle and farther than the elbow then let him do so and some of the ulama of hadith, they say that this part of the hadith, whoever has the ability to do so, then let him go above the elbow and above the ankle. They say that this is not from the statement of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, but in fact this is from the statement of from Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. As our shaykh, he didn't bring this point. And I remember many of the ulama when they speak about this hadith That they mention that this is in fact From the statement of Abu Huraira And not from the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best Then the shaykh he says uh, Shawkani rahimahullah And it's permissible to wipe over the two khufs And this is from the hadith of Al-Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Humam ibn, ibn al-Harith Harith Qala ra'aytu jarir ibn abdillah bala Thumma tawadda'a Wa masaha ala khufayhi Thumma qama fasalla Fasu'ila faqala ra'aytu nabiyya Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sama'a mithla hadha Qala Ibrahimu Fakana yu'ajibuhum Lianna jariran kana min akhir man aslama from this hadith of Al-Bukhari a Muslim, Hammam ibn al-Harith, he said that I saw, rahimahullah, he said that I saw Jarir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu urinate and then made a wudu and then he wiped over his two khufs and then he stood up and made salah 
And then he was questioned and he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu do exactly what you saw me do. And then Ibrahim, uh, and Ibrahim, when the ulama mentioned him, they usually refer to Ibrahim al nakhai from amongst the tabi'een, who said that we used to be amazed by this because Jarir was amongst the last people to accept Islam. And this was to just to show that this is definitely a part of Islam, of wiping over the two khus, as he was amongst the latter people to accept Islam, to show that this was the last thing that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was upon before he died. So we see from this hadith that it is permissible to wipe over the two khus. And then Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, he says that the wudu is not an Islamic wudu until you have the intentions. And this is from the hadith of uh, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah. <coughs> uh, excuse me, from the hadith of Al-Bukhari and Muslim on Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala samirtu rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqulu innama al-amalu bin niyyat wa innama li kulli imri'in ma nawa fa man kanat hijratuhu ila dunya yusibuha aw ila imra'atin yankihuha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajra ilayhi where Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, actions are by intentions and everyone has what he has intended. So whoever makes his hijrah to the dunya to get some of it or to a lady to marry her, then his hijrah is for what he made hijrah to. So we see from this hadith that all of the deeds, they have to have the intention. Not that you just wash these, these body parts, but that you have the intention as Imam al-Shawkani he says uh, that it doesn't become an Islamic wudu until you have the intentions to become in the state uh, that makes it permissible for you to make the salah and to have the salah accepted in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning to have this wudu that will put you in the state of tahara, that will make it permissible for you to make the salah. So this is what Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah, that he brings concerning that which is compulsory for the wudu that which is compulsory for the wudu and he says that it's compulsory on everyone who is of age to say bismillah when he remembers and to rinse out his mouth with water and to sniff the water up his nose and blow it out and then to wash all of his face and then to wash his hands up to the elbow including the elbow and then to wipe over his head and his two ears and it is sufficient if he wipes over some of his head and to wipe over his turban and then uh, to wash his two feet up to the ankle and it's permissible for him to wipe over the two khufs and the wudu isn't Islamic until it has the intentions to make it permissible for him to make the salat and this is the statement of Imam al-Shawkani and these are the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah to support what Imam al-Shawkani says, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The intentions, inshallah, is it something that we have to state, like verbally, or could I consider my intentions by walking to the bathroom or going to the wudu station? Uh, the intentions... The place of the intentions is in the heart, as the ulama say. Uh, the ulama, they say the intentions is in the heart, and the statement is a bid'ah. To say, I intend to make a wudu for the sake of Allah, so that it will be permissible for me to make salah, as there is no salah without wudu. This statement on his tongue is a bid'ah, as the ulama say. The intentions is in the heart. And uh, like the brother gave an example, when you go to the bathroom to make a wudu, you're intending to make this wudu uh, for the sake of Allah so that uh, you will be able to make salat to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. So the intention, the place of it is in the heart and the statement on the tongue of it is bid'ah as the ulama mentioned. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu wa barakatuh. A person performs wudu and he wipes over his khuf. You have to speak a little louder, Akhi. Okay, if a person performs wudu and he wipes over his khuf and then later... He hasn't gone to the bathroom or anything, but he takes off his khuf. Does he need to wash his feet again or make an entire new wudu? 
the issue of wiping over the khufs, we're going to handle that, inshallah ta'ala, when we get to that point. We just wanted to make sure that uh, every point that was mentioned, that wiping over the khufs is permissible. And the points that Imam Ashokani mentioned, we wanted to mention that. Otherwise, uh, when we start branching off, we're going to branch off into another section. And uh, Imam Ashokani, rahimahullah, he didn't bring another section uh, specifically for the khufs. But we're going to bring a section, inshallah ta'ala, that is uh, 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 specific or especially for the verdicts pertaining to wiping over the khus. At any rate, to stay in brief, whoever takes off his khus, he's still in wudu, as taking off your khus isn't amongst those things that break the wudu. And we're going to cover, inshallah ta'ala, that which breaks the wudu. And uh, uh, to add, and we'll add it again there, that when we cover the things that break the wudu, at that time the people can ask, does this break the wudu? And that does that break the wudu? And then we're going to ask him, why? Did you read a hadith that says that such and such broke wudu? Or that such and such broke wudu? Otherwise we're going to take a look from the Quran and the Sunnah at what breaks the wudu. And then everything outside of that doesn't break the wudu. And uh, taking off your khufs doesn't break the wudu. Allah, barak fee. Uh, you, you also mentioned um, about the parts that are being watched and said three times. So if somebody watches a part, that part that we mentioned three times, one time, there's many times. Yeah, uh, uh, I see uh, uh, the brother's asking, uh, we mentioned from the hadith of the Prophet Sallam washing the parts three times. Is it permissible to wash it only two or only one time? Yes, it's permissible to wash it only one time or two times. And this is why we didn't mention the three being compulsory. Because it's going to come in the chapter of those things that are recommended. And, uh, and, previ- and uh, the other class when we handled the wudu, I just jumped straight from the author's book, left them, pushed them to the side, and just went into the description of the wudu of the Messenger of Allah, to salam from so many questions. But on this book, we wanted to hold fast to the book of Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, to make sure that we get these points down, not only by getting the points down, but also to, to study in light of the way that the ulama and the students of knowledge had studied and learned this deen. And then after we get that down, then we will add on, inshallah ta'ala, like the point that the brother uh, brought up, inshallah ta'ala. So the statement of Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, is clear, inshallah ta'ala. One of the other ulama, and this is in the same chapter, and uh, I don't want to say that the people aren't real students from their questions, but uh, these questions would have been more proper to be asked. And this is, is putting uh, water in your beard compulsory? Is putting water in your beard compulsory? As we didn't mention this from amongst the things from of being compulsory and then we have the hadith of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said anna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana idha tawadda'a akhadha kaffan min ma'in fa'adakhalahu tahda hanakihi fa'khallala bihi lahiyatahu wa qala hakadha amarani rabbi azza wa jal and this hadith is collected by Abu Dawood and it's authentic inshallah ta'ala where Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he used to make wudu that he used to get a handful of water and he used to put it under his neck area and then he used to put it up through his beard and then he used to say this is the way my Lord Azza wa Jal had commanded me this is the way that my Lord Azza wa Jal had commanded me <coughs> so because of uh, this hadith of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, amongst uh, some of the ulama they say because of this that it's also compulsory to take this handful of water and to make sure that it gets all through your beard as the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said this is what my Lord has commanded me and if we've been commanded to do something then it's compulsory and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best yes uh, and in another class. Uh, uh, 
Also amongst the points uh, to be mentioned or to be questioned, is it compulsory to, when you wash your hands and your feet, to go in between your toes? And we have the uh, statement of the Messenger of Allah, إِذَا تَوَضَّعْتَ فَخَلِّلْ أَصَابِعَ يَدَيْكَ وَرِجْلَيْكَ And this is collected by Imam Al-Tirmidhi and Abu Majah and it's authentic, where the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you make wudu, then I command you uh, to put the water between your fingers and between your toes. So from this statement of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, I command you that uh, some of the ulama, they say that it's compulsory to put water in between your fingers and in between your toes when you make the wudu. Also amongst the points to mention, is it compulsory or not? Uh, is the point of uh, be you, beginning with the right hand and the right side first. And uh, here the Shaykh mentions the statement of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, إِذَا لَبِسْتُمْ وَإِذَا تَوَضَأْتُمْ فَابْدَأُوا بِأَيْمَانِكُمْ In this hadith, the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, when you put on your clothing and when you make a wudu, I command you to begin with the right. And the statement of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, I command you to begin with the right, shows that it's compulsory to follow this commandment of the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, and beginning with the right when we make a wudu. Also, amongst uh, those things that would be questioned, is it compulsory to do when we make a wudu, is... Is uh, is it compulsory to uh, uh, is it compulsory to go in this order all at one time when you make a wudu? And uh, we'll see, inshallah ta'ala from the statement. <coughs> and this is from uh, Khalid ibn Ma'adan on the authority of some of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam أنه رأى رجلا يصلي وفي ظهر قدمه لمعة قدر درهم لم يصبها الماء فأمره النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن يعيض الوضوء والصلاة and this is collected by Ahmed and Abu Dawood and others and it's authentic where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw a man making salat and he saw on the back of his foot that it was like the size of a coin that was dry, that no water touched it. So the Prophet ﷺ commanded to, to make the whole wudu over and the whole salat. And the ulama, they use this uh, hadith to show that the wudu has to be done uh, all at one time. Meaning you can't, uh, for example, say you have two hours before the salat. Alright, you wash your hands, your mouth, your nose, your face, then you take a break. Read some Quran, then in an hour, you wipe your head, your ears, then you cool out for another 45 minutes, then you wash your feet, then you say, I'm in wudu. But it seems from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, <laughs> as that person only left one point, the Prophet could have told him, just wash that, and you'll be in wudu. But it seems to show from this, that the wudu has to be done all at one time. The issue of does the wudu have to be in order in some of the ulama, they mentioned that it has to be done in order to, and we won't mention that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but this is what we wanted to bring from those uh, things that are compulsory in making the wudu. And then we're going to go to the chapter, inshallah ta'ala, those things that are recommended for the wudu and then those things that break the wudu and then uh, we'll take a look at some other hadith of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, related to the wudu inshallah ta'ala uh, the sisters have a question in performing wudu can you rinse the mouth and take water in the nose at the same time uh, this is one of uh, the points that we're going to mention later on from the hadith mentioned to it 
that when you uh, rinse your mouth and then you do your nose, that you can do all of this with one handful, as the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam do did. However, I saw understanding from the people that uh, I thought was surprising, and I I didn't hear it until some time between that and that to show that if somebody did that, that it would be okay. And the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as he used one handful to do his mouth and his nose sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I don't know if there were any other questions. Humran. Humran. And use the word Maula. 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 I don't know why people call this stepchildren Maula. Maybe this is just something new. The word Maula it has uh, uh, some meanings in in uh, Arabic. Amongst the meaning of the Maula is our master Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as we said in the surah to Baqarah anta maulana fansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin you are our maula anta maulana you are our maula that's amongst the first most important meanings of maula also from amongst the meaning of maula is uh, uh, a person accepts Islam from you He's your Mawla. Meaning he came to this deen by way of so and so. Also from amongst the meanings of Mawla is uh, a person has been raised in, with a people. He's not from that people. Like you have uh, nowadays, you have a lot of the Arabs being born and raised in America. So they be like Mawla Americans. Meaning he's an American. Born here, raised here, all of this land, all of the lifestyle of America. They know it inside and out just like anybody from America. But he's not American. Because his lineages, his parents came and the Arabs and they brought him here. This is uh, also from amongst the meanings of Mawlas. And from amongst uh, our Mawlas is our Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli. Who wanted the people to know that though he's from Egypt, that he said, I've been in America so long. And I've seen and been through everything any American Muslim has been through that I'm just from the people just like anybody else. And that's why he considers himself to be amongst the American Muslims. And that's why he's spoken his da- focusing his da'wah. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him successful. Also from amongst the meaning of the mawla is like the servant slave type of thing. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I try to ask this question a few times. And it doesn't seem to be real clear to me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It's kind of like, I don't know, uh, a servant slave. Or something like that. Not like one of those slaves you just purchased that you got from uh, the war booty or something like that. But it's kind of like your slave, your boy or something. You cool with him. You know, you kind of bought him, but you kind of set him free. But he's kind of feels like something, you know, that he's indebted to you or whatever, and it's like that type of relationship. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about this final meaning, as I tried to ask about it quite a few times, and I don't have any more than what I had, and if somebody knows uh, more about this last meaning, then we hope that they present it to us, inshallah, Yes, yes. Yes, yes. No, it has uh, Mawla doesn't have anything to do with the children Just for the sake of being children Or stepchildren or something The word Mawla And we might have been affected by this uh, From the Pakistanis Or the Indian Muslims And the literature that comes from Out of there And Urdu, Mawla It kind of means the word Sheikh So they say that's our Mawla Or our Mawlana And they mean Sheikh so, really, uh, that's outside of the Arabic language. That's their language. And maybe because they're Muslim, sometimes that thing is carried over. But it's not from 
an Arabic word that the Mawla means the Shaykh or Alam or something like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows first. Yes, sir. Let me take him then I'll take one shot. Uh, if you give somebody shahada, is there some extra rewards that go to you? Uh, yes, whoever invites someone to Islam, then he's going to get the reward of everything that person does in his Islam. So when we accept Islam under so and so, so and so gets the reward for what he does in Islam, and he gets our reward for everything we do in Islam. And then plus we still get the reward for what we do in Islam. <laughs> Inshallah Ta'ala And uh, that's a discussion We had I think discussed it before In the class on 60 ways of Jannah Or one of the classes on the purification of the soul And to look, took a look at some of those hadith Of the Messenger of Allah uh, Around that uh, I wanted to add And this is only for me And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best Sometimes you know because they think you're the imam Or you're learning The people bring the people who really They brought into Islam to let you give them the shahada. I wouldn't say, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that I'd be the one getting their reward, as really the other person brought them to Islam. And they just made somebody else make them say it, but really Islam was explained to him by somebody else. And that's only my outlook, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.